Hi, and welcome to this session about software update solutions for the Yocto project and Open Embedded. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you very much to the Linux Foundation team for organizing this event. My name is Leona Levy, and I'm a senior software engineer and an open source enthusiast. I work for Consumer Group. This is a services company specializing in embedded Linux and open source software. My colleagues and I have a lot of upstream contributions to popular open source projects, such as the Yocto project, Open Embedded, the Linux kernel, U-Boot, Automotive Grade Linux, and many more. Kunsuku Group is specialized in hardware, software build, design, development, and training services. The company is uh, with a headquarter in San Jose, California, but uh, has an engineering presence worldwide. I'm personally working from Poldi, Bulgaria remotely, and I have colleagues uh, from around the world, including the United States, Canada, Spain, um, Sweden, and Germany. The agenda for the talk today is um, about software over the air updates from the perspective of the Yocto project and Open Embedded. This is not the first uh, talk on this topic, uh, neither the last one. However, the special thing about it that this focus is from the point of view of uh, developers familiar with the Yocto project and Open Embedded. Uh, in, in the beginning, we'll briefly mention what is the Yocto project and Open Embedded. After that, we'll have a look at the challenges for software updates of embedded Linux devices. We will continue with an overview of the various open source software update solutions. There are many of them, so we'll have a closer look at three of them, uh, Mender, Rauk, and LibOS3, which was previously known as uh, OS3. Finally, uh, we'll uh, wrap up with some conclusions and there will be time for questions and answers. The duration of the talk is approximately 40-45 minutes, so we'll have 5-10 to 10 minutes for answering questions at the end of it. Um, so let's talk about embedded Linux devices at the beginning. Uh, embedded Linux devices dominate various different industries. Here at Consuku Group, we have customers from the automotive industry, from medical uh, industry, from telecommunications, uh, for various companies making uh, very interesting internet of things. Um, obviously, those devices are completely different uh, in terms of purposes. However, there are certain similarities between them. Um, f f all of them need a build system to build a custom Linux distribution for their own need and a software update mechanism. Uh, among the best practices of the industry is to uh, use uh, popular, stable, open source products for the build system and for the software update mechanisms uh, in order to save time and money and to focus on the core features of the embedded device that you are working on. The Yocto project uh, is not the only build system available there on the market, however, it's my preferred. Alternatives are uh, BuildRoot, PDX, Linux, or even uh, using a general purpose uh, distribution such as uh, Debian and customizing it. However, uh, my preferred choice is the Yocto project because of uh, its uh, flexibility. Um, a few words, what is the Yocto project? It's an open source collaborative project of the Linux Foundation for creating a custom Linux based system for embedded devices using the Open Embedded Build System. Uh, the Open Embedded Build System brings BitBake and Open Embedded Core. Uh, furthermore, the Yocto project has a reference distribution called Pocky. Uh, it is provided as metadata without any binary files. The idea of Pocky is to bootstrap your own distribution for embedded. Uh, Linux devices as a quick start and after that uh, to increment it by adding new features to it. Um, the Yocto project has a biannual release cycle twice a year. There is a release. Uh, the, the latest release is expected this month in October. Furthermore, something new that uh, happened in the Yocto project and Open Embedded ecosystem uh, recently uh, in 2020, the long term support release was introduced. Uh, the first LTS release in the Yocto project is Dunfell. Uh, the idea of the long-term support releases in the Yocto project is to cover two-year uh, period. Uh, as you know, uh, developing an embedded de device has its own pace and sometimes making the hardware and after that the custom software for the hardware takes a, a significant amount of efforts. Therefore, uh, having a long-term support release simplifies the development of efforts. Now let's have a look at the Yocto project current releases. As I mentioned, there is a new release on every six months. 
uh, the uh, long-term support list is done for. This is version 3.1. It was released in April this year. And the new release coming in October is version 3.2, Gutter's Guard. Uh, a brief introduction to some of the important keywords in the Yocto and Open Embedded ecosystem, although I'm pretty sure that uh, the majority of the audience of this talk is already familiar with them. Uh, there are receipts and layers. Receipt is the most common form of metadata. Uh, it contains instructions as a list of settings and tasks for building packages that are then used to build a binary image which you flash on your device. A receipt describes source code, additional patches, dependencies for libraries or for other recipes, as well as configuration and compilation options. The layer is a collection of related recipes and configurations. Uh, layers isolate information used when building for multiple architectures. Uh, each layer is um, packaged in a, in a separate directory. Uh, the common notion is that uh, the prefix of this directory, uh, directory name starts with meta. Furthermore, the Yocto and Open Embedded um, has an excellent documentation the, uh, known as the Yocto Project Mega Manual. There is a link to it. With each release of the Yocto project, there is an update of the documentation. Uh, and um, it's a great source of information. Uh, I use it on a daily basis and I recommend to everyone, to anyone to have a look at it while working with the Yocto project and Open Embedded. Now let's talk about uh, software uh, updates uh, over the air or over uh, an Ethernet cable. There are so many things to consider. First of all, are there any limitations of disk space for the downloaded update? Can you afford to have like two identical partitions uh, or um, your constraint of disk space? Are there any limitation of the network bandwidth for the data transfer? For example, if you have a setup box that's connected with an Ethernet cable uh, with, with very fast internet connectivity, that's something that you should not worry. But if you are updating a wearable device or a vehicle, that's another story because you may need to use cellular data, um, which is not as fast and not as reliable. Uh, do you need a container-based solution? Nowadays, containers are very modern. We'll briefly talk about them. Um, do you need an AB? Uh, this is uh, uh, this means like two identical partitions on uh, which you have um, different versions as you switch between the versions, or you need a, a binary data update where you have a small footprint that you download only the differences and incrementally upgrade uh, your device. Um, how do you upgrade over the air, over um, a USB stick manually, a cable or something else? Is the device that you are updating mission critical? Furthermore, there are more questions that you should uh, uh, answer when you are making, um, when you are choosing uh, which uh, open source uh, software update mechanism uh, to use. Is there an uh, Yocto and Open Embedded BSP layer uh, for the hardware use you use, as well as integration um, for the uh, software update technology that you would like to use? Uh, which Yocto project release do you, uh, do you need for your product? Uh, as I mentioned uh, on the previous slides, the Yocto project has a new release every six months, but there is also long-term support. Maybe this is the one that you should use for your update. Finally, how to update a fleet of devices. With Internet of Things, um, you might end up with a, a lot of embedded Linux devices that you need to update simultaneously or um, to manage the, the different version on different devices. Which, uh, which is your preferred choice? So many, so many questions. And um, the answers are different depending on the specific project. So different uh, projects, different people have different needs. That's why there is a, a big variety of solutions, um, of an open source solutions on the market, how to achieve all these things. Uh, let's have a look at them. This is a list of uh, some of the popular open source solutions for software updates. Actually, not all of them. Um, Mender, Rauk, SW Update, SW UPD, Update Hub, Balena, Snap, which are a container based uh, solution, Oystree, uh, which is coming from the desktop world. However, uh, nowadays it's a core technology of various uh, software update um, services 
and technologies for embedded Linux devices. Actualizer and Actualizer Lite are applications uh, that are compa uh, compatible with OS3 and are um, supplementary applications for doing updates. We'll discuss them in more details in the coming slides. Um, other solutions such as Qt, uh, Qt uh, uh, OTA, Qt is relying also on OS3. Terizon, again, a solution uh, uh, relying on OS3, uh, which is uh, coming from uh, Toradex, or uh, RPM OS3, which is used in Project Atomic. So many choices. Uh, which one uh, is good for you? Well, first of all, we have to say that all these um, options have uh, different strategies for performing updates. Some of them are similar to each other, some, are, some of them are completely different. Um, so in my opinion, there are four uh, categories in which we can divide this open source solution. The first one is um, AB updates. The, this is dual redundant a scheme where you have two identical partitions. The idea is that you download the update to the B partition, after that the bootloader uh, you reboot the board and the bootloader boots from this B partition which you have previously um, previously downloaded the file and it becomes a partition. The delta updates are uh, quite more challenging because here we're talking about uh, binary diffs of the file system and downloading on only this binary diff which represents the difference between the update um, this is convenient for devices with uh, constrained uh, bandwidth of the network as well as disk space because uh, binary deltas are smaller, which means that are, they are easier to download and easier to store. Um, however, the uh, advantage of the AB updates is that you always have one partition that is known to work. While with the delta updates, the standard approach is that you have just a single partition on which we inc incrementally download the binary deltas and apply them. Furthermore, um, there are container-based updates. Balena, previously known as uh, Raisin, uh, is, uh, Raisin IO, is doing this. Uh, so if you are looking for container-based uh, updates, uh, as listed here on the previous uh, slide, you have Balena and Stuff as an option for this. Furthermore, uh, there is something really interesting that is happening in uh, the past few years, and this is a combined strategy. Um, an example for a combined strategy is to combine um, container technology with AB updates. Uh, the container technology has changed the way application developers, specifically working on uh, web applications, interact with the cloud, and some of the good practice, practices are nowadays applied to development workflow uh, for embedded devices, uh, and uh, especially for Internet of Things. Uh, in general, containers makes applications, applications faster to deploy, easier to update, and more secure through isolation within the container. Um, Yocto and Open Embedded provides a layer called Meta Virtualization. Uh, it brings support for um, various virtualization technologies such as uh, XAN, KVM, Libverge, uh, Docker, and associated packages necessary for constructing um, Open Embedded based virtualized solutions. Um, in, in my experience, uh, there are many, many cases nowadays of um, companies working on products where they are bringing containers to embedded Linux devices, but still need AB updates for the base Linux distribution built with uh, Yocto and Open Embedded. Um, so I quite often uh, nowadays uh, make um, uh, images uh, with the Yocto project that include meta virtualization with, uh, for example, Mender or Rauk for AB updates. This is something new, it's some kind of a trend which um, is really interesting. I think it's convenient and I expect that in future uh, we'll see more, uh, more of this approach. Now, let's have a look at um, some of the most popular solutions uh, which, with which I'm familiar. Uh, starting with Mender. Uh, Mender is available as a free and open source uh, uh, subscription uh, plan or a paid commercial subscription and enterprise uh, plans. Um, so the, of course the open source uh, plan for Mender is uh, completely free. However, it lacks some of the features that the commercial and enterprise plans have.
for example, de Delta updates are available only for the uh, paid plans. AB updates are uh, part of the open source uh, and Mender is known for its AB updates. The uh, Delta updates, uh, which I repeat, are part of the commercial and enterprise plans of Mender were introduced a year ago, uh, just in time for Embedded Linux Conference uh, 2019 in Lyon, France. Uh, furthermore, Mender provides a backend service. It's a hosted Mender, uh, which allows you to manage um, to manage you uh, to manage the devices. You can uh, host it on your own computer. Mender is written in uh, modern um, programming languages. It's a um, it's a relatively new but very stable technology. So uh, Mender is written in Go, Python, and of course JavaScript. Uh, the Yocto and Open Edit integration of Mender is done through an extra extra BSP layer called uh, Meta Mender. Uh, the whole source code is uh, licensed under Apache 2.0 and it's hosted in GitHub. Furthermore, uh, Mender has this Mender community layers in which you have various supported hardware and integration. Uh, pretty much these are the bits that are specific for a certain platform and not part of Meta Mender. Uh, the source code is available in GitHub, as I mentioned. The supported devices out of the box for Mender uh, through this uh, Meta Mender community uh, are uh, Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, various Intel x86-64 machines, Rockchip, Owinner, NXP, and furthermore. Um, so the, the idea is that you can easily uh, get started with Mender, build it for example for a Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone this, because this is a common target and pretty much any embedded Linux developer has one of these boards on his desk. Um, of course if you want to uh, work on a more professional uh, project and most probably you will not be using uh, Raspberry Pi for it, uh, then they have this uh, sample integrations for the most popular systems on the chip and furthermore you can do the same integration if you have a specific hardware. Uh, th this, is, um, this is a screenshot from uh, GitHub of MetaMender community. Uh, here you can see how this layer has, um, um, has sub-layers also with prefix meta followed, MetaMender followed by the um, specific target that they are made for, uh, such as BeagleBone, uh, ClearFox, uh, Corral, uh, Atmega, uh, At Atmel, uh, and so on, uh, including Raspberry Pi that we've uh, briefly managed. So yeah, the, the most popular way to get started with uh, a Mender and to give it a try, in my opinion, is just to, uh, to build an image for Raspberry Pi. Mender has an excellent uh, documentation and um, a good community. Uh, as you can see here in this Meta Mender community layer, um, then there are 10 contributors which are from, um, from various companies. So Mender is something that has been already adopted by the uh, industry and a lot of people are using it. Uh, Mender AB updates supports two client modes. The first one is the manage and by default uh, the manage uh, uh, client mode is supported. Um, the idea is that uh, the client is running as a daemon, it pulls from the server and when it detects an update it applies it. The standalone update uh, is another client mode that's supported by Mender, it's a um, pretty much a uh, um, solution um, which is convenient if you are doing um, an update with physical media such as USB stick or um, uh, any network in pool mode. Uh, the updates are triggered locally which is suitable uh, in this very particular use cases. Here is an example how you can, um, how you can run a Mender uh, client in uh, standalone mode, uh, if you build an image with um, with the Yocto project and open embedded in your local uh, .conf, you have to configure or either to do a BB append, you have to configure this uh, variable uh, system auto enable for the Mender uh, recipe and to set it to disable. Uh, as I mentioned by default, the manage mode is enabled. So if you set this variable uh, in your local .conf. Uh, to disable, you make sure that you are switching to a standalone mode. Uh, once you build um, uh, the image with the update artifacts, what you can do is to run a simple Python script as here, 
and after that uh, this is happening on the build machine of course and after that on the embedded device uh, for, the, for this example I, I have done it with Raspberry Pi 4 uh, you need to run this command which is mender install uh, uh, the path to the uh, uh, to the HTTP server that you have started and the update artifact which is with extension mender uh, so the steps to install a Mender update are actually three. First, you need to apply the update in the st standalone uh, uh, approach. This happens, uh, let's have a look back in this slide, on the last step when you run Mender install. This is when you apply the update. Uh, in order to, to, for the update to take effect, you need to, uh, to reboot the system. Uh, on the first boot, after a successful update, um, the Mender client um, checks uh, the status if it's successful it commits the update uh, so this is the uh, standard approach how to apply uh, an update and this is valid for both the standalone and the managed mode when mender is uh, working you still need to do a reboot after installing successfully an update um, i forgot to mention that uh, um, Mender works uh, also not only on ARM devices but also on, on Intel x86-64 and for ARM devices the uh, recommended bootloader is U-Boot. Moving on to the next solution uh, for AB updates again it's called RAUC. Uh, it's a lightweight update client that runs on your embedded device and reliably controls the process of updating it with new firmware revisions. Um, Furthermore, RAUC provides the tools uh, for the build system uh, to create, inspect, modify uh, update bundles. Furthermore, from security perspective, it uses uh, cryptography to sign update bundles. Furthermore, it's compatible not only with the Yocto project, but furthermore with BuildRoot and PDX Dist. However, we'll focus on, on the Yocto project for this presentation. Um, RAUC uh, has several components that are available under different uh, licenses. The, um, the uh, RAUC software itself is available under general public license version 2.1. It's hosted in GitHub. Actually, all components of RAUC are hosted in GitHub. MetaRAUC uh, is available under MIT license. This is um, the um, uh, Yocto and Open Embedded layer uh, which brings RAUC to your embedded device. RAUC whole bit uh, is a plugin uh, and RAUC whole, whole bit data. These are uh, the plugins needed for the whole bit, Eclipse whole bit um, web uh, system uh, with the user interface for managing a fleet of devices and applying update bundle, RAUC update bundles to these devices. Um, RAUC uh, is uh, recommending to use whole bit, but actually whole bit is uh, an open source project developed by Eclipse. Uh, the uh, last slides of the presentation will uh, talk a little bit more about it because it's recommended not only by RAW but by other um, software update systems. Um, the challenge about RAW are the integration steps. Uh, the integration steps are actually um, not so different from Mender. However, uh, unlike Mender, which have this community a layer with a lot of boards that are already supported and uh, most common boards such as Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone are already supported. This is not the case uh, with RAUC because RAUC just gives you meta RAUC and furthermore you have to go through um, and apply the specific steps for your device. Um, you need to select an appropriate bootloader for example if you're building a RAUC image for Raspberry Pi this is going to be um, you boot in the next slides, I'm going to show you uh, the exact steps for Raspberry Pi. Uh, you need to enable SquashFS in the Linux kernel configuration. Now, this is important. Uh, RAUC supports only X4 root file system. Uh, RAUC does not have an X2 or X3 file types. So make sure that you are using uh, X4 or a file system that can be mounted as X4 and recognized by RAUC. Um, you need to create specific partitions that matches the RAUC slots. Uh, RAUC supports the various slots which you can update and uh, there is uh, some flexibility how you can have several slots, for example, two redundant slots and one slot that is um, separate. Uh, furthermore, uh, you need to configure the bootload environment and create a script um, to switch between the RAUC slots. Uh, in the most common case, uh, you have A and B slot and you need a partition for 
uh, both of the, uh, these uh, slots. And uh, furthermore, you need to configure a specific uh, bootloader script, uh, for example, uh, for your boot. You need to write this script that switches between, uh, between, uh, between the slots and the partitions uh, after an update. Uh, update is applied with a reboot uh, with RALC, uh, just like uh, in Mender. Um, last but not least, uh, you need to create a certificate and keyring uh, to the RALC's file system conf. Um, these um, six uh, step major steps are uh, time consuming and uh, if you are a newcomer to RALC it could be a little bit difficult to get started. However, um, uh, recently, a few months ago, um, I created this layer called MetaRALC community. At the moment the only um, sub-layer available in it is for MetaRALC Raspberry Pi and specifically it's for Raspberry Pi 4. At uh, the website of consulco.com, I have published a blog post that explains the exact steps how to build a RALC image uh, for Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, there are several steps that you should do. However, uh, these six steps that I've explained are incorporated in MetaRALC Raspberry Pi. Uh, so you can just uh, reuse this layer, uh, change your, of course, your certificates because it's, uh, that could be a security issue and uh, you can get RAUC uh, working with the Yocto project and open embedded on a Raspberry Pi 4 with a simple uh, minimal or base image. Uh, now let's have a look at the uh, configurations uh, that you need to apply in your local.conf if you are using um, MetaRAUC plus this layer that I have created. First of all, you need to uh, specify the machine. Of course, Raspberry Pi 4 is provided by the popular BSP layer Meta Raspberry Pi. All those layers have to use the same uh, Yocto release. Uh, the particular example that I have created is uh, using uh, release Dunfeld. After that, I'm switching uh, to using systemd. Um, what's important is that uh, I'm adding RAUC um, to, to the image with image install append. Um, the image FS type has to be set to X4. I've mentioned that uh, RAUC uh, uh, is compatible only with X4. Uh, furthermore, we need to select the bootloader. Uh, the default Raspberry Pi bootloader is not compatible with, um, uh, with Raspberry Pi and it's not a good choice. Uh, you need to use uh, U-Boot as a bootloader uh, because this way uh, I have already created um, U-Boot environment variables and a script to manage switching uh, partitions after a RAUC update. This is something that is part of the layer uh, available as MetaRAUC Raspberry Pi in MetaRAUC community. Uh, so here is how uh, to perform an update. So uh, after building an image and an update bundle, uh, update bundle is the phrase uh, that uh, RAUC uh, uses for the artifact that you uh, download and install on the device. So after uh, building an image, booting it on a Raspberry Pi, after that you need to, to make an update bundle to build it with BitBake. And then you can go to the directory where it has been built to start a simple Python or whatever is more convenient for you, a simple HTTP server. And on the embedded device, you have to download the RAUC bundle. Uh, here, the example is uh, very straightforward. I'm just downloading it with wget and uh, into the temporary directory. And after that, I'm using the uh, command line um, command for RAUC to install this, um, this update. Um, so I'm typing RAUC, install the temporary directory and the name of the update bundle. Um, in this case, the recipe for creating this uh, update bundle is update uh, bundle followed by the uh, machine name, which is Raspberry Pi 4. After applying the update, I need to reboot. If everything is okay, uh, the scripts uh, for U-Boot provided through Meta uh, RAUC uh, Raspberry Pi uh, will check um, the status and uh, if everything is okay they boot the, the new partition which we have uh, booted. Here is, a, here is a diagram which has been taken from the documentation of RAUC. You can see how the bootloader uh, first boots from a partition, downloads the, um, downloads the um, update bundle, flashes it on the uh, B partition and after a reboot if everything is okay the B partition is booted and it becomes an A partition so you can do another update if you want. Now moving on to uh, something um, 
uh, completely different. So far, we've covered Mender and Rauk, which both use AB updates. And now we're going to talk about LibOS3. This is a shared library and a suite of command line tools for committing and downloading bootable file system trees. The interesting part here, which makes it very different from the other technologies that we've already reviewed, is that LibOS3 supports Git-like model for incremental autom automatic um, atomic updates of a file system using binary deltas. So pretty much you generate just the difference as a binary delta, you download it to an embedded device and you apply it. Um, after an update, uh, a reboot is required so that the changes will take effect. Persistent data is kept in var and ATC directory. Uh, previously, libos 3 was known as OS3 and it's uh, still valid to call it OS3. So on many occasions uh, you might hear me and see it uh, in various resources as OS3. Um, LibOS3 has a very good documentation. I have to say that uh, this, this is a quite old project. It started with GNOME Continuous, so it's a project coming from the desktop to, to the embedded uh, devices. Exact steps for adapting an existing mainstream GNU Linux distribution uh, to LibOS3 are available as part of, uh, of the documentation. The source code of LibOS3 is written in C, uh, but language bindings are available through G object introspection. Um, so uh, it's, um, it's something that you can use with various programming languages. Uh, LibOS3 is compatible with multiple bootloader options, including group, uboot, and uh, initramfs. The source code is available at uh, GitHub under a GPL version 2 license. Uh, nowadays, there are more than um, 100 contributors. I have to say that in the past, uh, three to four years, uh, LibOS3 became um, very, very popular because nowadays it's widely used uh, on embedded devices. So it's not so something that was uh, only used uh, for desktop. The documentation is available at uh, oystredev.github.io. Um, speaking about the integration of Oystre in the Yop to an open embedded, I have to say that uh, four years ago I was involved uh, in writing the very, very first recipe um, for OS3. On the left side here, uh, you, can, you can see a screenshot from Automotive Grade Linux. Um, Automotive Grade Linux is a project of the Linux Foundation. It uses OS3 uh, for doing software over the year updates. The initial um, uh, contribution of OS3 was done in the summer of 2016, uh, and, and it was part of the layers of a AGL. After that, uh, they were uh, moved as external layers known as uh, meta updater, uh, which we'll explain in more details in the next slides. Uh, so nowadays, OS3 is not part directly in AGL, but instead it's used through um, other layers that are incorporated in AGL. Furthermore, uh, um, last year in 2019, Alex uh, Kiernan included OS3 as a recipe in Meta Open Embedded. Meta Open Embedded is probably the most popular um, extra uh, Yopton Open Embedded layer, providing uh, various recipes. I'm a regular contributor to Meta Open Embedded, primarily to Meta Open Embedded, uh, Meta OE and uh, Meta Python. So um, continuing further, um, speaking about OS3, we need to mention uh, Actualizer and Actualizer Lite because both of these are important for embedded devices. Actualizer is an open source client uh, that runs on the embedded device. It relies on OS3 to download and install the update and Actualize communicates with the server uh, in order to understand that there is a date and to uh, apply it. Initially, Actualizer was uh, developed by a company called ADS Advanced Telematic Systems. Um, in 2015, 2016, um, initially they had an um, application called RVI Soda Client written in the RISC programming languages, language. Uh, however, they decided to completely rewrite the program in C++ and to call it Actualizer. This is a company uh, with um, an office in Berlin. That's why the name Actualizer sounds so German. I was involved in, uh, in this process. Actualizer became part of automotive uh, uh, great Linux. Uh, the company that I work for, Consulto Group, was, was under a contract with ATS for uh, this development. Um, after that, uh, HERE acquired ATS, and nowadays Actualizer is part of the HERE portfolio. Uh, HERE is uh, actual, sorry, Actualizer is compatible with Geneva SOTA and Uptain uh, requirements. As I mentioned, it's uh, written in C++. The source code is available 
uh, in GitHub under Mozilla Public License version 2. Now there is another company, uh, Founders.io, which decided to create a um, simple version of Actualizer. They called it Actualizer Lite, uh, as the name suggests. Uh, it's a lightweight uh, open source version of Actualizer, which allows two things. Uh, these are the two major differences between Actualizer and Actualizer Lite. Um, Actualizer Lite allows anonymous access and requires devices to be always up to date. Uh, this is something that's uh, different from the obtained requirements. Um, so why is this different uh, dif uh, difference? Uh, well, obviously things become easier with Actualizer Lite. However, Actualizer itself is made by the requirements of the automotive industries for vehicles and Actualizer Lite is more suitable for um, Internet of Things. There are many OS3 based solutions for embedded uh, Linux software updates nowadays on the market. I'm starting with here OTA Connect, uh, which is with Actualizer, the layer meta updater, as well as a bunch of additional um, meta updater BSP layers, uh, for example, meta updater Raspberry Pi. Um, so uh, the supported uh, devices are Raspberry Pi, Quemo, Intel X8664, with minimum board being the reference uh, board RISC V. Texas Instruments, as well as Renaissance boards. The Renaissance boards are um, used in automotive grade Linux. Unfortunately, uh, on 31st, 31st of August uh, this year, here uh, announced that they are removing OTA Connect from their portfolio. Uh, so um, any uh, users uh, subscribed for the uh, free evaluation uh, version will have access until the end of November. Uh, of course, um, Actualizer and meta data are open source projects that are available in GitHub, so the, the source code uh, will remain. However, they will be not, uh, in long term, they will be not actively maintained by here. Uh, but there are many other companies contributing to this, uh, these projects uh, because they have been already uh, integrated in um, different products and projects. One of these projects is the automotive grade Linux, uh, the AGL sort of feature in AGL is based on meta updater, actualizer, and OS3. <clears throat> I've also mentioned uh, uh, Foundry's I.O. Uh, they are developing actualizer Lite, as well as uh, they're contributing to meta updater uh, Yocto layer, and they have their own layer called meta LMP. Furthermore, uh, Toradex is developing the Terizon OTA solution for Toradex Apalis, Colibri, uh, Verdin IMX devices with IMX 6, 7 and 8 systems on the chip. Uh, also, these devices must have e, uh, eMMC for uh, Terizon OTA to, to use. Um, <clears throat> a Terizon OTA is using Actualizer and uh, Layer Meta Toradex Terizon. Um, you can follow the uh, link here. Uh, by the way, I'll upload the slides at the end of the presentation. So uh, you can follow the link and learn more details. More uh, OS3 based solutions. Qt OTA also uses, uh, uses OS3 and it's for embedded devices. Dome Continuous, Project Atomic, Flatpak, Pulp Platform. A lot of uh, solutions are using OS3. Finally, at, uh, we're coming to the end of this presentation. I would like to mention Eclipse Hogbit. This is not a solution for performing an update, but rather this is a web based uh, interface with a, a server backend for performing uh, update. It's a domain independent backend framework for rolling out software updates to constrained edge devices as well as more powerful controllers and gateways connected to IP best network infrastructure. Um, Eclipse Hogbit is written in Java. It's available on GitHub under EPL uh, version one license. Furthermore, both RAUC and SW update um, are using uh, Hogbit for perform updates. Um, in the previous slides, I've uh, explained about uh, the RAUC bundles, how you can create a RAUC bundle. Well, with Eclipse Hogbit, you can apply this, this bundle on your device. A couple of screenshots here. Uh, this is um, taken from Eclipse uh, Hogbit documentation. You can see on these two screenshots that you can, uh, from, from your web browser, you can um, manage the deployment of, uh, to the devices as well as to upload um, um, of, uh, update artifacts which should be deployed, deployed to the devices. 
So at the end of this presentation, let's make some conclusions. There are many open source software solutions for software um, updates, uh, which have already support for the Yocto project and Open Embedded. Pretty much all of the popular have uh, support for the Yocto project and Open Embedded. So if you have already selected uh, the Yocto project and Open Embedded for a build system, there are plenty of options that you have. Um, obviously, you need to select a solution that fits your need best, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of solutions on the market, as I have explained. So things have changed uh, since the past five uh, years. Um, so it is very uh, important to and recommended uh, to use an actively maintained uh, Yocto release, uh, for example, the LTS release. Furthermore, to choose an open source software update mechanism that is also actively maintained. Um, software updates depend on the bootloader, especially for ARM devices, U-Boot uh, is preferred choice. I've uh, explained this uh, for both, uh, I've explained this in more details about RAW, but it's pretty much uh, similar for uh, other uh, solutions as well. For AB updates, um, probably Mender is the best choice because it provides you um, excellent documentation, easy getting started. And um, furthermore, the paid plans for Mender have some uh, very important uh, extras such as uh, the robust Delta update. An alternative for AB update uh, is RALC and SW update. Uh, speaking about Delta updates, Libs OS3 is commonly used as core technology in uh, various open source solutions, no matter if we're speaking about, uh, um, about uh, a product uh, or a service because uh, nowadays there are so many companies providing a service, as a service uh, software updates. Furthermore, combining AB updates on the host OS uh, with containers coming from meta virtualization, for example, Docker is nowadays also often used for embedded devices. This is an interesting opportunity, especially if you have in your organization developers already familiar with the workflow for uh, submitting uh, and using um, uh, con containers. There are many talks about software over the air updates. Um, here is a list of some of them, but before I, I uh, read all of them, I would like to highlight a talk from last year by Chris Simmons, which was comparing uh, using Debian or the Yocto project for embedded device. Um, and uh, Chris made a great presentation with the advantages and disadvantages. Have a look at it. And if you're still wondering whether to use uh, Yocto project, uh, this is uh, something that might help you make the choice. Uh, furthermore, the CTO of the company that I work for, Consulco Group, Matt Porter, did a very interesting comparison of Linux software update technologies back in 2016. Four years ago, things were uh, quite different. And Matt Porter made a great presentation, very technical presentation. So you can have a look at it and you can compare how things have evolved since then. Um, Phil Weiss did another presentation um, about AGL. I've uh, mentioned AGL in my talk, Automotive Grade Linux. Uh, from in this presentation from 2017, uh, you can learn uh, internals and details about the software over the air uh, updates in AGL. For, furthermore, uh, there are interesting talks from Fosden by Enrico, uh, Enrico Jones uh, and uh, from uh, uh, Bartosz at EOC last year, as well as Stefano Babic. Uh, they're all um, maintainers of uh, open source um, software solutions for over the air updates, and the talks are very interesting and uh, uh, contain a lot of details. Thank you very much uh, for joining this session. Uh, here are some useful links. Uh, if you would like to read and learn more about the things that we've discussed. Now we have time some, uh, for some questions and answers. I'll be happy to hear your questions. Thank you very much for your attention.